most of us are not aware that the peoples whom the classical Greek and Roman historians called Berber were black and affiliated with the then contemporary peoples of the East African area. في بيت التقليدي القديم طبعا الحالات تغيرت والزمان تغير بدينا نديروا فيه البيت التقليدي it depends on who's writing the book right um, uh, ain't, uh, from a, a, a strictly scientific scholarly perspective, mm -hmm. yeah, there's no such thing, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. There really is. Mm -hmm. But depending on what point you're trying to make, you can make different points. Right. Okay, so this is how I teach it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the first mention of the term Berber, mm -hmm. as far as I know, mm -hmm. is m um, early medieval Arabs. Mm -hmm. There's a scholar called Wahib ibn Munabe writing in around 738 AD. Mm -hmm. He says, among the descendants of Kush, mm -hmm. the descendants of Ham, and he gives a list, mm -hmm. and in that list is Barbar, right, yes. Berber. Mm -hmm. yeah? That means they're black. Mm -hmm. um, the black Arab scholar Ibn, excuse me, El Jehis, mm -hmm. he also says the Berbers are black. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the fact that you've got two populations that people call Berbers, mm -hmm. Somalis, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and North Africans. Yes. Now, the Somalis are obviously black. Mm -hmm. What about the North Africans? Mm -hmm. Well, again... يعتبر أصحاب من أهم مكملات الزينة لدى المرأة الجنوبية ولا تخلو مناسبة نسائية دون أن تنتشر رائحته في أرجاء المكان حيث يأخذ أصحاب مكانه جيدا بين عقود الذهب والفضة مثلا الصدارات في الأفراح في العراس كل اللي, اللي مشات يحضر الفرح تلبس تصديرتها بالإضافة للصخاب هو اللي يكمل اللبسة طبع تصخاب في ذاكرة كثير من سكان المنطقة بالأفراح والمناسبات السعيدة ولعل هذا ما ساعده على بقائه حاضرا بقوة في لباس النساء اليوم لأخبار ليبيا 24 عبد منعم جهيمي سبها so the Berbers today, when people talk about Berbers being Northwest Africans, mm -hmm. the language Berber mm -hmm. is Tamashek. Tamashek is what's spoken by the, um, the Tuaregs. Right. And the Tuaregs are mostly mm -hmm. around your complexion, yes, to sir, be yes, honest. Sir, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah? And if you go to the ones in um, Niger, mm -hmm. they're more kind of my complexion. Right. I'm the Sultan of all the Tuareg of the Ayir. I have just replaced my father who died in 2012. The role of the Sultan is crucial in maintaining social cohesion. I act as an arbiter between the different clans. I mobilize them and I raise awareness among the youth against and the violence. when you go to some of the ones in the deserts, they're absolutely jet black. Absolutely. So in other words, you've got a whole... Now there are some light-skinned ones as well. And obviously when you write, you see books written by Europeans, mm -hmm. they want to point their cameras at the, at the palest ones yes, yes. and present them. Yes, that's but, the According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy, and hence the word is often used for a Negro. The anthropologist Dana Reynolds, in an exhaustive and meticulously detailed essay, has attempted to trace the African roots of the original North African peoples. She cites half a dozen Greek and Byzantine Neo-Roman writers from the 1st to the 6th century AD who describe the Berber population of North Africa as black-skinned. Among these writers are Martial, Silas Italicus, Chloripus, and Procopius. The original black Berbers, who were called Moors, were the North African ancestors of the present-day dark brown and brown black peoples of the Sahara and the Sahel. The Berbers, therefore, were the Moors proper, but the term was conventionally applied to all Muslims of Spain and northwestern Africa. Because the Moors are the same as Negroes, Mauritania is the same as Negroland. 
and contrasting the Moors of the 6th century with another racial group in North Africa. Procopius, circa 550, wrote that they were, quote, not black-skinned like the Moors. Isidore, a Catholic scholar and the Archbishop of Seville, 587 to 636, wrote that the word Amoris meant black. In addition, Harold A. McMichael points out that the Africoid blacks, the Tibul and Tuareg, resembling the ancient Nigritians of the Sahara, are by origin Lambda Berbers. Wa ibn Munabi, who died in 732, wrote that the Berbers belonged to the black races of Ham. The Moors were people who lived in Morocco. That's the reason they called it that. The word Moor meant black. It meant black people. 
In ancient times, all Africans were called Ethiopians or Cushites, and in the Middle Ages, the Africans were called Moors. The word Moor literally means black, so the Moorish people were the black people. The inhabitants of present-day northern Africa are considered ethnically and culturally distinct from the people dwelling south of the Sahara. If this is so, it has only come about in relatively recent times. The 700 years that the Moors dominated the Iberian Peninsula was an era during which many people, mostly of European descent, either migrated or were brought to the lands of Arabia and North Africa. Although large numbers of blacks were brought from the Sudan during that era, studies of the slave traffic of that time show that the numbers of people of Slavic and European descent placed into servitude far exceeded the number of Sudanese or other blacks bought and sold by the Moors. This part played by the European captive or slave in the making of the modern North Africans and Middle or Near Easterners has been ignored by historians to such an extent that most people are not even aware that such an era ever existed. This is partly the fault of the successors of the Orientalist school. It is often not talked about but the Moors had enslaved the Europeans before they enslaved blacks. Their women were sold like commodities into the harems and as concubines of wealthy Moors. This is the reason why the Moorish noble were for the most part bleached out and became as tawny Moors. In the ancient Roman text, Claudian, a prominent Roman of the 4th century AD, complained about Gildo, the Moorish ruler in Algeria claiming that in handing over Roman matrons of Sidon to his fellow Moorish countrymen, he made hideous Ethiopian hybrids affright the cradles of Roman provinces of northern Africa. One of the culprits he names in this regard are the Berbers. Gildo himself was one of the borrowers. The use of the term Berber in this paper will thus be for the original indigenes of North Africa known simultaneously as Moors and Ethiopians, who were the wandering Libyans spoken of by Herodotus. <laughs> ساكن رقصة شعبية عريقة تربعت على عرش قلوب سكان الطوارق في مدينة غات وأخذت مكانها باكرا وسط رقصات شعبية لا تقل أهمية عنها فأصبحت عنوانا لثقافة محلية تأبى الانتظار تؤديها مجموعة من الفتيات دون سن الثانية عشر وتقام عادة في ليلة الحناء في أعراس خات على أنغام الجنجا تمسك كل فتاة بيدها اليمنى جزءا من ثوبها يسمى إخباي خاص باللونين الأخضر والأبيض أو الأخضر والأصفر وتحركها يمنة ويسرة وأحيانا أخرى ترقص بأكتافها one very famous sultan, Moulay Ismail of Mekenes in Morocco, had as many as 25,000 European slaves who participated in the building of his colossal stables. Sudanese were also taken into slavery, but before the 15th century, not as many as the whites. It was these Europeans who began to modify through intermixture the earlier black inhabitants of North Africa. This is what eventually made so many North Africans appear different from the sub-Saharan Africans. 
There is no question that there are groups of black Berbers in the northern countries of Africa. These are all folks from Morocco. These are the black Berbers. None of them are in positions of power in the Moroccan government. And the reason for that is because Morocco also has a very large black population. And these people are called Berbers. Here is a Moroccan, sisters from a postcard.
got a baby on her back. This is a Moroccan sister also who was referred to as a Berber. Okay, now let me go back to what I was talking about before. She's a Berber. Okay? She's customarily what Western historians, when they talk about the Moorish legacy and influence, want you to focus in on. All the Moors descended from people who look like her. That's the illusion that people are trying to present. This sister is also referred to as a Berber. They're both Berbers. They're both Berbers. Then we have the Vandals in the 5th century. Mm -hmm. These are people coming out of Germany. Mm -hmm. And they conquer North Africa uh, in the 5th century. Mm -hmm. Their descendants are still around. Right. Then, of course, you've got the Arabs mm -hmm. that conquered uh, 639 AD. Mm -hmm. And they have added to the, mm -hmm. the white population. Now, not every Arab is white, mm -hmm. but the ones that are in North Africa most certainly are. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the Arab slave trade mm -hmm. of Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so a lot of Eastern Europeans got snatched, a lot of them ended up in the Middle East, a lot of them ended up in North Africa. Right. So again, a lot of white Arabs yes. are actually Slavs. Right. And that, that they've again added to the variety of North Africa, mm -hmm. um, the Sea Peoples as they're called. Right. People coming in from the sea. The Mediterranean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then they attack Egypt during the time of Ramses III. Mm -hmm. Again, they add to the non-black populations. <laughs> Sur la tête, la mariée porte nombre de voilages tels Eshmam, Zouada et El Mraya. Le visage de la mariée est recouvert d'une voilure appelée El Marhma. La beauté de la femme Warkini qui transparaît de façon évidente durant les festivités se base essentiellement sur des produits naturels tels le... According to James Wellard, author of Lost Worlds of Africa, Muslim Africans brought millions of European slaves over the centuries into the North African ports of Saleh, Tangier, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, Fez, and Marrakesh, and the northern Egyptian towns. Literally millions were documented as being freed in North Africa by various Christian organizations in Europe. Philip Curtin points out in Ayai and Crowder's History of West Africa that the majority of slaves being traded throughout the Mediterranean, including North Africa and the Levant, modern Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, West Syria, centuries before the fall of Constantinople, when the Black Sea trade was cut off, were of European descent. It is also known that indigenous Bedouin used to come into slave markets of the coastal cities of northern Africa and Arabia by way of the desert to secure concubines who were often of European descent. In 1150, the religious order, the Trinitarians, was founded in France to free Christian Europeans by purchase and, according to J.A. Rogers, for the next three centuries or more, collections were taken up in the churches for that purpose. In Nature Knows No Color Line, Rogers also cites notes of Sir Walter Scott on Spanish Chronicles which say that European Christians in Spain were forced to pay tribute to the Moors in the form of women. Even in 1721, King George I spoke of the great number of his subjects 
that had been delivered into slavery in North Africa. One rather famous Moorish Sultan, Moulay Ishmael of Meganes in Morocco, a few centuries ago had as many as 25,000 European slaves who participated in the building of his colossal stables. The phrase black as a moor was used from Roman times until the Middle Ages. The black and woolly haired Christ, sometimes seen in the Iberian Peninsula according to the famous traveler James Michener were referred to as Moors rather than as Negroes, which is derived from the Latin Niger or Negra. This interpretation does not explain the hundreds of jet black men with woolly hair who appear later in European coat of arms and heraldry under the dozens of variations of the term Moor. The Berbers of the Romans the word Berber is utilized to describe present-day inhabitants of North Africa who speak a pre-Islamic North African dialect. They represent a highly amalgamated peoples varying in appearance and morphology. Modern-day Berbers, however, modified by racial intermixture, still speak a language related to other indigenous dialects of Northern and Eastern Africa. We're in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, looking at a painting by Lucas Cranach, the Elder. It's a painting that should not be hanging by itself on a wall. It shows St. Maurice, but it was originally part of a much larger altarpiece. It would have been just one of many panels. The altarpiece from which this painting comes was located in what is today Germany, in Halle. It was commissioned by a very famous cardinal. Albrecht of Brandenburg, who was the most important member of the Catholic Church in the Holy Roman Empire. The painting is actually a representation of a life-size reliquary of St. Maurice that was in the collection of Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg. The painting survives 
Gardens, but unfortunately the original reliquary does not. It was destroyed in a fire. This painting was produced before the destruction of the reliquary, although it's important to note that it was painted probably from a watercolor made of the reliquary, not from the reliquary itself. Before the reliquary was destroyed, it and more than 300 other of these important reliquaries were actually painted in watercolor. So we still have that book that shows us what these reliquaries would have looked like. This painting is looking to that watercolor, and the reliquary was one of the most important in this collection because St. Maurice was the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire since the 10th century. The Holy Roman Empire was a political entity in Western and Central Europe. When this painting was produced, which which is sometime around 1520-1525, the idea of the Holy Roman Empire is important to keep in mind, as is a Catholic cardinal, because the Protestant Reformation has just happened. In 1517, Martin Luther posts the 95 Theses on the Castle Church in Wittenberg and unleashes the Protestant Reformation, which will fracture the power of the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe. And something that Protestants do not agree with is the concept of a relic, that we have a painting here that is showing a copy of a relic is important in this context. That is actually made even more complicated by the artist. Lucas Cronick the Elder is a very well-known artist of the German Renaissance but he was also the artist of the Protestant Reformation. Here he is painting an extremely important saint. And one of the things that Luther finds problematic are the idea of saints themselves. We're in this transitional moment, in this transitional place. But for all that, we haven't even gotten to the single most interesting part in this painting, which is the subject, St. Maurice, is represented as a black African. St. Maurice was an early Christian saint he lived in the third century, and he was actually born in Egypt. He was part of a Roman legion, and he was martyred. He was killed along with some of his men when he refused to kill Christians. And so he's beheaded. That takes place in what is now Switzerland, a place that was then part of the Roman Empire. And St. Maurice, as we mentioned earlier, became the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire in the 10th century. And it's around that time that his cult or his veneration really begins to increase. And then in the 13th century, you begin to see transformations in the way that St. Maurice is depicted. One of the earliest representations we have of him as a black African comes from this area as well. It's a three-dimensional sculpture of him. From about the 13th century until about midway or the late 16th century, He's shown as a black African. And here depicted with great nobility, wearing incredibly elaborate armor. In fact, armor that was modeled on the armor of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. It's a type of armor that's known as field armor. And here you can see that it's been highlighted with gold and with an extraordinary array of jewels. We're able to date this armor to around 1500, 1510, because right at that moment, you have huge transformations in the style of the armor that we see, especially in the feet. Armor went from a pointed toe shoe to a flat toe shoe. This armor that is modeled after Charles V's armor is in vogue at that time. Look at the hat that he wears. It's fringed with these lovingly painted ostrich feathers and he holds a banner on which you can just make out the edge of the emblem of the Holy Roman Emperor. The eagle. And we even see symbols of what look like the papal keys on the bottom of the banner as well. We also see a symbol of the Order of the Golden Fleece that's just above the necklace and attached to his armor. The Golden Fleece was an extremely prestigious order that was associated with chivalry and then had been formed in the 15th century. And so the church that this reliquary was in, we presume that this altarpiece would have been there as well. The patron saint of that church was also Saint Maurice in addition to a couple of other saints, including Mary Magdalene. So we have a lot of ways in which this painting is reminding us not only of the reliquary, but also of the patron of this church, also of the patron of the Holy Roman Empire, and the power of the Holy Roman Empire in many ways, which is referenced in the way that St. Maurice is displayed here, very regal, very confident, very stately. I want to pick up on that issue of power for just a moment, because it's not just the power of the emperor that's at stake here. 
The value of a relic was in its spiritual power. And it's interesting to think about whether in the 16th century, when this was painted, whether or not a depiction of a relic was imbued, at least to some extent, with the power of the original. Something that is so important here as well is to remember that there were many different peoples living in Renaissance Europe at the time. Here we have St. Maurice, born in Thebes in Egypt, who is displayed as a black African. And there were many peoples from Africa or of African descent who were living in Europe. And so it would not have been out of the ordinary or strange to see people of color in the Renaissance. And scholars have conjectured that people of color were commonly part of the courts of Europe and so occupied privileged positions in the political hierarchy of Europe. Unfortunately, by the later 16th century, a process of whitewashing occurred and St. Maurice is actually then displayed as white. There is this dynamic that shifts in the context of the 16th century where the issue of what we call race does seem to matter and become important in the later 16th century. And it's interesting to think about that dynamic in relationship to Europe's colonial expansion during this period. European powers are are asserting themselves in the Americas and increasingly in Asia and in Africa. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that when St. Maurice is being shown as a black African, it's at that same time where you also have one of the Magi, Balthazar, being shown as a black African as well. Herodotus mentions that the Ethiopian Trogodites also lived in the Fezzan area of Libya. The Mori Mazazeses or Mazikes in the area of Tripoli and Tunis were called Ethiopians in an ancient Roman document. All of the most important Libyan tribes are described as black-skinned. Marshall, Charippus, Procopius, Juvenal, and Silius Italicus referred to the Mores as black-skinned. The word Moor signified a black man and the people who were called Moors were the North African ancestors of the dark brown and brown black peoples of the present-day Sahara and the Sahel. It was such populations that largely comprised the Moorish people called Moors from the Greek Mores the Roman Morris or dark because of the attribute of blackness which sharply distinguished them from the bulk of the European people however the inhabitants of present-day North Africa are considered ethnically and culturally distinct from people dwelling south of the Sahara this is only so today because of the considerable influx of European types during the white slave trade and their later movement in positions of dominance after the defeat of the Moors. This necessitated ignoring the ethnic heritage and history of the men called Moors who were in fact people called in ancient times Berbers one is led to believe from recent writings on Berbers that they were hordes of tanned European looking men with no affiliation to the black skinned lightly built Africans that the ancients said they were. Instead we are told they were Africans of the white race which semi white men of the Orient had converted to Islam and led into Portugal and Spain. Waves of colonizations by Romans, Greeks, Turks, Iranians, Iraqis, and others combined with the Europeans to bring about the gradual modifying of the physical appearance and culture of the people in the areas of northern Africa. 
then we get the Roman conquest of Carthage in 146 BC. Mm -hmm. um, the Romans don't just conquer, they colonize. Mm -hmm. So they move families yes, into yes. North Africa. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of white North Africans are actually descended from mm -hmm. them. The West has always played down, ignored, or completely denied the role of colonization, slavery, and concubinage in the creation of the population of coastal cities of North Africa like Cairo, Tunis, and Algiers. This population is phenotypically similar in many respects to those areas on the opposite side of the Mediterranean in the southern portions of Europe. European academia has usually preferred to see this demographic phenomenon as testimony to the Caucasoid or European origin of such peoples as the ancient Berbers, Moors, and Egyptians. It is because the original populations have since been overwhelmed by others biologically and culturally. Today in Libya, you can see the legacy of this early melting pot. Walking down the streets of, of present-day Libya, I'm always struck by the, the incredible diversity of humanity that, that one encounters. And that reflects broadly the sort of crossroads position of, of, of Libya within the Mediterranean with its Saharan hinterland. So now, the issue there is that um, most people tend to think that ancient North Africa was European. Um, so do, do we need to continue to dispel that myth? It never was European. Right. It never was. I mean, it is now, yes, but that's yes. a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, North Africa, the, the very first North Africans um, that we have documents about mm -hmm. were the Egyptians, mm -hmm. the Libyans, mm -hmm. the Carthaginians, mm -hmm. and the Moors. Mm -hmm. And all four groups of people are described as black. Mm -hmm. They have chosen to concentrate on the most recent world of the Arab and Berber speaking peoples and present it as if it is a world that has always been. It is like comparing the Aztecs of 500 years ago with the ethnic mix of America today. The revelation of these rock paintings in the Tassili Mountains of the Algerian Sahara just 30 years ago astonished the world. Whole communities of people who are obviously African in origin had created marvelous galleries of ancient art depicting most vividly the life of the Green Sahara as it must once have been. First we see hunting folk and the animals they lived among. The clearest proof that this region of the Sahara long ago teemed with wild game. The earliest paintings may be seven or eight thousand years old. But not all the people who inhabited this huge region were nomadic hunters. This horse, complete with saddle and bridle, points to the development of transport systems and traders. And this ox-drawn plough to the planting and growing of crops. Whether for war or sport, elaborate chariots came into use while the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. The evidence of these paintings suggests a continuous community of peoples living right across the Sahara, from the Atlantic to the valley of the Nile. But, but do do the reading. And when you're doing the reading, learn two things. The truth, and you need to know the lies better than the liars know the lies. So that way, when people chat rubbish, you can mm -hmm. discard. Mm -hmm. Well, again, if we go back far enough, everybody in North Africa was black. Yes. This is a Tuareg festival held in the Hagar Mountains and it will go on for a week or more.
Today the Tuareg no longer spend their time raiding the caravans or fighting among each other, but they still live as they always have, the life of desert wanderers. High up in the Hagar Mountains, 